Hello, hello. We're just going to give everybody about a minute or two to trickle on in here. So we'll get started in about a minute. Let's see here, all right. Right here, and then also too, uh, feel free. You can make comments in the chat if you. And I'll reiterate this again as before we get started. But if you have any questions as we go through uh, today, Celi, I should probably move my mic closer. That might help you hear me. If you have any questions as we go through, please don't hesitate to put those in the Q and A section. You'll see up there on top for your Zoom or on bottom, depending how you have it oriented. But put your questions there, and we'll get to those questions at the very end of the program. But thank you very much for joining me today. Again, we'll get started in just a second. I would say, hey, chat with me and tell me where you're watching from, but I know every, everybody's watching from Florida. Uh, shout out to anybody that's watching from Holly Hill. That's where half my family is. <laughs> so if anybody knows where that is, I'd be very impressed. All righty, so let's go ahead and get started because it's 1101. I do not want to abuse your time. <laughs> so really welcome everyone to today's CLE. It's a guide to law firm succession planning. So from emergency plans to exit strategies, do you have a plan for your firm? And before we get started, a little bit of housekeeping. We'll have the CLE session course number, all that information, all that jazz that'll be available uh, towards the end of today's CLE. And then in addition, again, if you have any questions whatsoever as we go through this, we're going to go through a uh, Q&A section right at the end of this, probably the last five or so minutes of uh, today's CLE, we'll be answering your questions live. So please just make sure to put them into that Q&A box. We'll monitor the chat box too, just in case you put a question there, but definitely put it into the Q&A box if you have a question that you want answered. All right, so let's get started a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Jordan Turk. I'm actually a practicing family law attorney down here in Texas. So, you know, all the drama, all the time, it's real fun. <laughs> and then I'm also the legal technology advisor at Smokeball. I got my uh, law degree from the University of Arkansas, Wu Pig, uh, and my undergraduate from the University of Texas. Hook'em Horns, I did not know that Arkansas and UT used to play each other in the Southwestern Conference, did not know that until I got to Arkansas and was told that I couldn't wear a burnt orange shirt there. It was news to me. Anyway, so prior to coming to Smokeball, I actually worked for a high asset family law firm in Houston, which was even more drama all the time, which was great, except it wasn't. <laughs> so, all right, so as we get into this, I wanted to say, so I am a legal technology advisor at Smokeball. I now work in law firm practice management uh, simply because my firm was terrible <laughs> about any type of technology when it, came, when it came to running cases. We had 5 million different pieces of technology. None of it was cohesive. So I had, at one point I calculated it out. I think I had nine separate logins <laughs> to nine separate pieces of legal technology software and none of them were a practice management software platform. So it drove everybody crazy, drove everybody nuts. And that was actually part of the reason why I pivoted into legal technology, actually. So a little bit about Smokeball and what we do here. So we are an all-in-one cloud-based practice management software, which means that, you know, think about Smokeball as your firm's entire ecosystem. So from intake to initial pleadings, to discovery, to mediation, to final trial, once mediation fails horribly, <laughs> we do everything for you. We help you with it, right? So we help you prepare and save everything down into one centralized system. So it's not saved on some random paralegal's desktop that you cannot access and things like that, which used to drive me nuts. Can you tell? Uh, so this means, though, that by using uh, this type of software, you're only going to enter case information or client information one time. That's it. And everything else that you pull up in that case, whether it's a pleading or whether it's, you know, some form of discovery or whether it's just a form letter to a client or opposing counsel, all of the relevant information is already going to be pre-populated and auto-filled in for you. So there's no longer any need to triple check whether you spelled the client's name wrong or right, which happened to me many times. And there's also no more having to copy paste things, no more having to find and replace words in you know, your final orders or decrees, which was a huge deal for me. It was a lot of finding and replacing when it came to you know drafting uh, orders and things like that. Smokeball also offers time tracking, which no one else does it like this. So essentially there's AI that exists in the background of your computer uh, that, uh, that will tell you how, what you worked on, 
for what case and for how long. So for instance, if I spent two hours drafting a decree in the Johnson matter, it's going to spit out a timesheet for me at the end of the day that says that I spent two hours drafting this decree in the Johnson matter, as well as sending an email out in this other matter, things like that. It's a very powerful piece of technology, which is amazing and was the best thing for me because I always had a problem in putting my hours. <laughs> and then we also have pre-built workflows for specific practice areas. So obviously me as a family law attorney, I'm going to have completely different <laughs> workflows than an estate planning attorney or a criminal law attorney. So you can access all of these workflows. It's all under one umbrella. You don't have to pay extra for specific areas of law. It's all just there ready for you integrations with Microsoft Office and Outlook especially, so no longer having to save down uh, emails, which was always my biggest problem was saving down pertinent emails, and I hated it, so actually we do that for you. There's a form library. We have over 20,000 forms for you that can get, again, auto-populated, you know, pre-filled in for you, and then powerful insights and reporting. So if you want to do three-way trust account reconciliation, you know, if you want to do what Florida requires and have monthly trust account reconciliations, it's important that you have the proper forms and the proper uh, reporting available to you so that you can do that easier and not have your bookkeeper or your office administrator want to tear, tear their hair out. You know, I speak from experience with that. All right. So moving on, I will say if you do want to learn more about Smokeball, we're going to have a poll at the end of this. I'm also happy to talk to you about how it revolutionized my firm and what I do with it. Just shoot me an email, but you can also select that you'd like to learn more about it during our poll at the end of the session. All right, so getting into today's CLE and what we're going to talk about. One, a duty to report. So this goes kind of hand in hand with an unexpected cessation of practice where say something happens to you or you suspect something's happening, maybe with a colleague uh, of yours or maybe a firm employee, do you have a duty to report that person to the bar and then what happens with their client files, things like that. Uh, file management and destruction policies for transitions. What do you need to do with all that paperwork, <laughs> whether it's electronic or not. And then plan transitions and exits. So, hey, I want to get out. Finally, it's ready for retirement. What should I be looking for? What should I be doing? And then for unexpected cessation of practice, say that five times fast, <laughs> but really what happens if there's a medical event? If you are in the hospital for an extended period of time, what do you need to do in order to protect not only your firm, but also your clients, right? Because above all, this whole thing, <laughs> this whole CLE is really about protecting the duty that you owe to your clients and not getting into weird, you know, ethical gray territory or bad ethical territory, as we'll find out. All right, so part one, a duty to report. So for Florida, they have rule 4-8.3, which is about reporting professional misconduct. So it's a lawyer who knows that another lawyer has committed a violation of the rules of professional conduct that raises a substantial question as to that lawyer's honesty, trustworthiness, or fitness as a lawyer in other respects must inform the appropriate professional authority. So what does that actually mean? Because actually 4-8.3 doesn't specify what it what is meant by prof appropriate professional authority. So generally, we're going to interpret that as meaning the Florida bar, right? But arguably, that would also mean a court or even another bar association. So maybe your local bar association. And further, the rule requires that you have actual knowledge of a violation by another lawyer that raises a substantial question as to that lawyer's honesty and things like that. So it's actually a pretty high standard to achieve before this rule is even implicated. And there's been... A lot of chatter, there's actually quite, a, there's an opinion about it too, about uh, attorneys threatening <laughs> to report other attorneys uh, for professional misconduct. And they're using that as a threat, which by the way is unethical, but to make sure you have to have actual knowledge of what is going on and it has to raise that substantial question. So remember that you need to be meeting that threshold before you can do anything regardless. And also I wanna point out when things kind of bleed over into the Florida Lawyers, Lawyers Assistance Program. So as many of us know, generally bar proceedings are going to be confidential during the investigatory process. In Texas is pretty much the same way, right? I didn't learn about a grievance that was filed against me by a BS opposing party <laughs> until actually Texas had already dismissed it, right? So it's just a confidential portion of the process. But I also know that the Attorney Consumer Assistance Program, the ACAP, ACAP, frequently actually does refer respondents that are in trouble with the bar, obviously, to the Florida Lawyers Assistance Program. And 
many times actually they're not even prosecuted or they're only prosecuted if the respondent fails to comply with that diversionary program. So something to think about as you go through if, you know, if these if these attorneys that are imperiled and in trouble, uh, if something could happen to them where actually they could go through a diversionary program as opposed to going through a whole bar proceeding, guess what? The bar a lot of times does recommend that they go through that diversionary program anyway. All right, part two. File management destruction policies for transitions. The sexiest topic I know that you will ever read in your life. Okay, so I like to call this part a journey of file retention and destruction. And what I want you to ask yourself as we're going through this next section is what happens to all of that paper or electronic file if you have it electronically, which does make it a lot easier, but most of us deal with a lot of paper on a regular basis. So the problem with this is you have no custodian designated, chances are. Or if you do, you haven't gotten it updated, Florida now requires it. That's an inventory attorney, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. But if you're just starting out and you're trying to figure out what you need to do when you're talking about file retention and destruction, look into, and we'll talk about it, a custodian attorney. Ask yourself who can actually access your files. So generally, that's going to be the people in your office, right? The people that are protected with under attorney-client privilege. And generally, when I have a client that signs a fee agreement with me, I lay out exactly who can work on their case. So it's going to be my office, and then I spell out the paralegals, the legal assistants, and anyone that might get added on, on board later, and they're notified of that. So there's actually a very clear line about who can access their files and who cannot. And then also asking yourself, what about attorney-client privilege? Are there any implications here? with regard to that, with regard to who can actually access these files outside of your office. And we'll go through that. All right, a journey of file retention and destruction part two. So what can I do to start actually managing my files? So, hey, this is the bare minimum. What should I be looking at? So for one, destroying your files in accordance with Florida bar rules would be <laughs> you know, the best thing that you can do as far as how long you need to retain them. The answer is it depends. Every lawyer's favorite response. So trust accounting requires a six-year retention for the Florida bar. So no matter what, you have to keep those for six years. You can keep these electronically. Just make sure that you're adhering to the bar's uh, rules of professional conduct with, in accordance with that. Uh, also, Contingent fee contracts and closing statements regarding those contingent fee cases are also retained for six years. And that's a minimum for both of these. So remember that. But the best practice that I can tell you when it comes to retaining files is to call your malpractice carrier. So remember, this is part of the reason why you pay them, right? This is part of the reason why I have to pay this high premium every, you know, every year or month of my life is for them to be able to answer the answer me and answer these questions. Also, I will say, if you're doing that, just my ardent and abundant paranoia to get it in writing from your malpractice carrier and make sure to save that response down. All right, as we continue along on our journey, so what should I do when a matter is concluded? One, go through the client file and see what needs to be returned to the client. Obviously, if it's electronic, you know, Texas now does certified copies of things, so I don't have to give them an original of a certified copy of their decree. You know, I can just send that online, so that's wonderful. But there are specific things that are, you know, maybe originals that I absolutely don't want to keep. So I also do transfer of property issues. So I definitely do not want to keep a deed of trust to secure assumption, or I don't want to keep a special warranty deed original at my office. I don't like that liability, you know, at all. So I'll try as much as I can to get the client to come and pick that up. And, uh, and so that I don't have to think about it anymore at my office. And then also you'll have to notify the client that the file is being closed and for how long the firm is going to retain the file. And we'll talk about the proper way to do that, or I think the easiest way to do that in a, in a, in a minute, but just keep that in mind. Uh, offer, to offer to have the client come and pick up copies of their files. So the biggest thing about this is CYA, CYA, CYA. When a client comes to pick up their file at the end of their case, make sure that you have some sort of standard template that exists on your firm drive or on your practice management software <laughs> that is basically a receipt for the client when they come to pick up their file. So make sure that everybody in the firm understands what this is, where it is, because chances are the receptionist is going to be out to lunch at some point, or the legal assistant isn't going to be able to do it, and the attorney or the paralegal needs to know that this template exists and that they must have the client sign it as soon as they come and pick up the file. 
But not only that, the client's going to sign it. And then what you're going to do is immediately scan it into your system. And then you are immediately going to send the client a copy of that email or a copy of that document. Because what ends up happening, as so many of us know, especially those in family law, is they come and pick up this file. You have them sign this receipt and you don't send it to them. You just keep it for your own files. And then suddenly six months down the line, a year down the line, the client's going to say that you never gave them their file or that you refused to give them their file. And how dare you? And oh, you have this document attorney? Well, guess what? You forged my signature. So it's this whole thing. Avoid all of that by just having your process be, hey, client's going to sign it. We're going to scan it into our system. And then we're going to immediately email it to the client to confirm that they picked it up. Just do it. You'll thank me later. <laughs> and then uh, next to, oh, and I want to say something about this is when the client comes to pick it up or when you offer to have the client come pick up their file, do it as soon as the case ends. Don't wait. The longer you wait, the harder it is to get the client to actually come and pick it up or do anything, right? Because the client has just paid you a significant amount of money. And even though it was a good <laughs> result for their case, chances are they don't really want to see me again for a very long time. So strike while the iron's hot when it comes to having your client come and pick up their file. And then also protect unique client property. And what I mean by that is originals, like I kind of alluded to before, but we're looking at deeds, we're looking at wills, we're looking at prenups. Again, you need to make a more substantial effort than you would if it was just the regular client file to try to get them to come and pick it up. And again, the longer you wait, the harder it is to do. And Florida actually released a couple of opinions on this. Uh, there's one 81-8 and 63-3 just about how to properly dispose of files. So in addition to what I just went over, a big part of it, of it is if you are unable to contact a particular client, you need to review that client's file and remove any original documents or important papers. So obviously wills, contracts, things like that, that might later be vital to the client's interest. And then you have to, and this remember this is for clients that you haven't been able to contact. And then at that point, you have to index those documents and then you have to retain them for what the bar says is a reasonable length of time. So obviously that's going to be very subjective depending on your case. And then after that reasonable length of time, you can dispose of the remainder of the file. But also when you are disposing of that so file, reasonable care needs to be taken to protect client confidentiality, everyone's favorite term. Uh, so again, when I say best practices for that is Things should be cross-cut, shredded, or burned. They shouldn't just be thrown into the break room trash can, right? Because that has some issues when it comes to client confidentiality. All right, pertinent duties for client files. So a couple ethical rules that I just want to run through just to have in the back of your mind as we go through this is uh, rule 4.1-1.3, diligence. So a lawyer shall act with reasonable diligence and promptness in representing a client. I'm more concerned with the comment, and I think that's more relevant for today, is even when the client's interests are not affected in substance, however, unreasonable delay can cause a client needless anxiety and undermine confidence in the lawyer. So even if it's just a random surprise trip to the hospital that you as the attorney have to take for a few days or a week, you need to have a plan in place because it is your duty to act with reasonable diligence and promptness in representing a client. And if they can't contact you and they have no idea what's going on, obviously that's going to cause them a bunch of needless anxiety. Just having a plan in place will help you and we will take you through how to have that plan in place. All right, pertinent duties for client files. Again, so this will be about communications 4-1.4. A lawyer shall keep the client reasonably informed about the status of a matter and promptly comply with reasonable requests for information. So, hey, if I get into an accident, if I'm not there to answer my client's emails, if I'm not there to answer my client's phone calls, how would the client get their answers? These are things that you need to be thinking about as we go through the CLE. All right, and then there's 4-1.6 confidentiality of information. So a lawyer must not reveal information relating to a client's representation, except as stated in subdivisions B, C, and D, which we don't need to go through, you're welcome, uh, unless the client gives informed consent. What I really wanna point out here is to remind everybody that this attorney-client privilege and confidentiality of information survives the termination of the attorney-client relationship, right? So if something happens to me, that privilege still lives on despite the fact that I may be now deceased or incapacitated, things like that. So really quick story time with this is that 
there was a really contentious uh, divorce case happening in Texas, and the husband actually had his own firm. He was an attorney, and it was a terrible, super horrible divorce case, a lot of vitriol on both sides, things like that, and actually, freak accident, husband attorney ends up dying during the divorce case. Well, then wife said, okay, well, all this is mine, and before, I guarantee you, before, before the document uh, declaring him deceased was signed, she went to his law office, opened the door, had the key, uh, already got the key from the family residence, opened the door, took all of his client files, and systematically went and put them on the curb of the law office and left them there. So luckily, there was another attorney that was close by who saw what was going on and contacted the state bar, and the state bar was able to swing by and get all the client files. But I say all this to highlight that it's a very serious issue about confidentiality and attorney-client privilege, because for one, she obviously had no, no privilege existed between her and these client files. And then two, confidentiality-wise, it's a huge breach if somebody else were to find those client files. So something to think about as you move forward, too. And then also, just as an aside to not be this type of counsel, but at one point a colleague was working a divorce case and she represented wife and during the divorce case, the wife died. She passed away. And the husband's attorney came to her office and demanded the wife's client file, which obviously my colleague said, absolutely not. Please leave. I can't believe that you even asked for that because again, remembering that attorney-client privilege survives the death of the client and survives the death of the attorney. So just all that to say, don't be that attorney. Also, too, I want to point out, sorry, I keep saying also, <laughs> remember that family members are wonderful, but they are not firm employees, right? So a lot of spouses or siblings want to step in and help when there's an unexpected tragedy or something else happens. But remember that they are not covered under your attorney-client privilege relationship, and they shouldn't be accessing your files or your trust account. So keep that in mind. Family members a lot of times <laughs> become a hindrance, even though they might mean well and all they want to do is help. But in reality, the better option is going to be to designate an inventory attorney, which we'll talk about and have a plan in place. All right, destroying files. So do not destroy a file before one, kind of a no-brainer, right? All, don't destroy a file before all ongoing proceedings or reasonably expected claims are resolved. Also consider all your applicable statute of limitations periods. Don't destroy a file before any period during which other laws, regulations, or tribunals uh, require it to be retained. So make sure that you're asking the right questions of your client. And then the most important one, to me, is don't destroy a file before your malpractice statute of limitations is up against the represented party. So remember, uh, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but the Florida statute of limitations for filing a legal malpractice claim is generally two years from then the client knew or should have known that malpractice had been committed. So again, though, best practice is going to make use of your malpractice carrier and the premiums that you pay and call them and ask them specifically, what's the bare minimum that I should be retaining these files for statute of limitation purposes for malpractice claims? And this was taken shamelessly from uh, Texas. They also did a course on succession planning, but it really is universally applicable. Uh, the four C's of client management. So one, compliant policies, develop a reasonably compliant file retention and destruction policy and implement it consistently. So every single person in your firm, from, you know, from your legal assistant to your receptionist, all the way to your senior associate should understand what's going on. And then also talking about consent. Big one to take from here is use engagement or fee agreements uh, to your advantage. And so for every single client, and include an advanced file destruction policy, which says, hey, client, we, you know, retain files for six years or for five years or however long you need to based on your malpractice carrier. And tell the client that because it's so easy at that point to get the client to sign off on that because they're about to sign on to the firm anyway. So they really, for one, probably don't care. <laughs> but that way, it's an informed consent. You can take them through it and tell them once you go, once you uh lead them through the fee agreement, but it's a lot easier to do that because then when it comes to destroying their file, all you have to do is reach out to the client and say, hey, in accordance with this policy and the fee agreement that you executed, we are destroying your file. Super, super easy, a lot easier and easier to streamline once you get into it and start including it in all your fee agreements. Very nice. Uh, and then careful review, always review files at termination or before destruction, which we already went over, and automatically return all originals and client property. 
also return the file upon request. A determine proper destruction policy dates and advise client that retained files will be destroyed per the policy. Don't hold onto files just because you can, because at that point you're going to fill up storage unit after storage unit after storage unit and pay an unnecessary amount of money to retain all these files simply because you're paranoid or you can't remember how long you're supposed to retain them, things like that. Have a standardized policy and destroy files in accordance with that. And because if you're going to be practicing 15, 20, 30 years, that's going to add up very quickly, <laughs> all that paperwork, all right? And then communicate, notify and inform the client if you can find them about the destruction of their files, make reasonable efforts to locate clients whom you cannot find. So maybe that's going to require a Google search out of you as opposed to just saying, oh, the email bounced back, I'm not going to do anything else. You need to be trying to find them. All right, plan transitions and exits. Everyone's favorite. When, when can I retire? What can I do? How do I sell my firm, right? So selling or transitioning your practice, there are three main traditional methods by which this is accomplished. First one is you hire a younger lawyer and you bring them into the firm, you transfer client matters to them. Super easy because they're technically an associate at that point. Uh, and then over time with client consent is when you're transferring them. And then you arrange your departure compensation at the proper time. It's beautiful, but it takes a little finesse, right? Because for one, I'm a little paranoid. You have to really trust this younger lawyer implicitly, right? You have to trust that they're not going to leave you hanging or leave you high and dry if they randomly decided that this wasn't for them and they were just going to leave and that they actually weren't going to take over your firm. So that's part of the problem there. <laughs> and then also to give them enough of a carrot to where they wouldn't be tempted to leave. So for instance, I had a managing partner that believed that loyalty was owed no matter what to them. And then they were kind of shocked when everybody started quitting because they were like, I don't understand, but you were underpaying everybody at the firm. You weren't paying market. Loyalty is not guaranteed, right? So even though you might've loved that managing partner or loved the firm, there's only so much you can do if you're being chronically underpaid, right? So just a word of caution that loyalty is not guaranteed right? And that you need to have some sort of incentive in place to keep them there. All right. And then you can also join or merge with another firm and introduce clients to the new firm attorneys and arrange compensation according to the value of the work or book of business, obviously, that you brought to the firm. And then you can arrange your origination and departure compensation accordingly. So if you know that you're going to be a rainmaker, if you know that your name automatically also already brings in clients, obviously that's going to be something that is valuable and you want to include in the valuation of your practice. Or you can also engage outside co-counsel with client consent, of course, and enter into a permissible, permissible can't speak, uh, fee sharing agreement based on work performed or shared. This is nice because there's no real confidentiality or conflict issues, right? It solves a lot of problems with the sale of your practice. So I see this probably more and more uh, when it comes to co-counsel. And when we talk about selling a law practice and you're wondering what's the bare minimum <laughs> that I need to adhere to, uh, obviously there are going to be other rules concerning this, but specifically Florida adopted 4-1.17 about the sale of law practice. And it used to be a myth promulgated across the US basically some time ago that attorneys actually couldn't sell their firms, right? Because they're like clients aren't commodities, how dare you, you shouldn't be able to sell it. However, you still can sell the business. Yes, clients are commodities, so they are actually given options to stay or leave and things like that. But the firm itself is a business. So yes, you can sell it. So pretty much every state bar has disproved this kind of myth that's happening. And then rule dash 4.17 obviously goes into detail and provides a roadmap kind of for what you need to do in order to stay compliant with your, bar, with your state bar as you kind of navigate the sale of your firm. So typically general overview of it is if you're trying, you can either, Florida gives you the option, some states don't, but Florida gives you the option, you can either sell all of your practice or you can sell a practice area in its entirety. So obviously once you sell it, you cannot, you can no longer practice with that if you're selling a, the, and if you're selling just a piece of it, say you're selling an area of practice. So, hey, I do general practice and I really hate family law at this point and I feel your pain. And so say you just wanted to sell off that portion of your firm, you could. You can completely sell off just that one area of family law and still say practicing with the rest. So that's absolutely an option for you. 
And then you also have to provide notice to clients. So written notice has to be served on them. You have to tell them about the proposed sale, their right to retain other counsel, and the fact that their consent to the substitution of counsel will be permitted or presumed if they haven't objected within 30 days. And then some of these cases too, if it's active litigation, it actually requires court approval. So there's no substitution or termination of representation unless it's authorized by the court in those cases. Now, you as the attorney can go and tell the judge in camera, hey, here's information relevant to this representation, only to the extent that you need to as you're selling this practice, right? So you can absolutely have that conversation with the judge if you need to. And then client objections. So if a client objects to the proposed substitution of counsel, uh, the seller must comply with the requirements of Rule 4-1.16, so obviously they can leave. <laughs> you cannot force this client to stay with you. And then consummation of a sale. Uh, a sale of a law practice may not be consummated until, one, with respect to clients of the seller who were, served with, who were not served with written notice of the sale, you have to give them 30 days. So 30 days must have elapsed no matter what, right? So you have to wait for that. And then two, you have to make sure that the court orders have been entered authorizing substitution of counsel or termination of counsel, things like that, except remember, the and this is only for pending litigation cases. And then in the event that the court doesn't grant it or something happens, and so maybe the court just is backlogged and they can't do it, there's no way, uh, remember that in matters that involve pending litigation for the in this instance, you can't include those in the sale. So if a court just has failed to respond and nothing's happened, all of your matters that have pending litigation can't be included in the sale. You can still sell it, but you can't include those cases. Also, if you find a client who has pending litigation, but you cannot find them, so they can't be served, right? They've just gone you know, into the wind. Uh, the proposed sale can also not include those cases. Which is all, always fun. So make sure to find your clients. And then the final one, which is for one, I think a lot of what most people forget about, and to me the most important is existing fee contracts control. So you can't go and immediately take over this other attorney's cases and say, hey, by the way, I know he was charging $250 an hour. Guess what? Everybody's now being charged $500. So you cannot increase your rate just by virtue of the sale. So when you're going and say you're the one that's trying to actually buy a firm. So say somebody's offering it to you and you're going through it and they actually have a lot of clients, things like that. But say they are severely under market rate, especially with regard to their billable hour. This is something that needs to go into your calculation because you cannot automatically just raise it just because you get these clients. All right, so valuing your practice. <laughs> so tips and notes. Uh, that I would do. One, here's the deal, universally applicable for pretty much every attorney in the U.S. Your firm and your practice is probably not worth as much as you think. In fact, it might not be worth that much at all. <laughs> so consider it how I kind of view it and how a lot of uh, attorneys view it is, how would this be valued in a divorce? So is my firm pretty much predominantly personal goodwill now? Am I, on a, am I a solo practitioner that gets a decent amount of work but is it solely due to the fact that it's just my name and because I'm going out there in the community and doing a lot of work actively in the community, right? Would the clients still be there after I leave? Is my name still going to be drawing in those clients or no? You know, would, I, would my name continue to be a rainmaker for this firm? Do I have clients that will stay on for years, right? You have a lot of family law attorneys that want to get out of the game, but they're really only as good as their active cases or if they're a rainmaker themselves because these cases will eventually end and they'll end pretty quickly, right? And the problem is a lot of those clients could choose to leave also. And then you're kind of left holding the bag of what the heck, or also pro tip, pro tip on this one. I'm very paranoid when it comes to firm sales and I've seen it a lot in Houston where people approach firms with an inflated book of business, right? They'll say, I have $3 million in this trust account. Look at all these active cases I'm working on. You should definitely make me an equity partner in this firm. But then it turns out the, the you know, $2.5, $3 million in this trust account, most of it was just holding on to property on behalf of your client. So it wasn't actually active funds that you were going to be able to bill against. It was, oh, a house or two was sold during the pendency of this divorce, and we have to hold those funds until, you know, the case is concluded. So be very careful 
and very meticulous as you go through their books, especially as you go through their trust account to figure out if they're actually feeding you a line or not. But this happens quite a bit where you definitely see these inflated trust accounts only for this attorney to come on board and you realize it was a lot of smoke and mirrors basically that they use. So always really great. And so I recommend that for one, if you're really thinking about getting a value on your practice, get a business valuation. Yes, it's going to be a little expensive, but that's going to give you the best, that's going to give you the best picture of your firm and the best way to go and approach another attorney about buying it is that you've already done your due diligence, which means that you need to be keeping immaculate records of your trust and operating accounts. So just really keep that in mind. The biggest thing, obviously, that anybody's going to ask about is your trust account. And if that's been taken care of properly, if that's been recorded properly, if that's been reported with the state bar properly, right? And then also, just an aside too, know the amounts and subscription periods of all of your leases and rentals. So think, here's my office space lease. It's on a 10-year rental. Here's how much we pay for printers. And here's a subscription to that. And for ink, even down to the food that comes in for the break room. Everything should be broken down. There should be the costs associated with it and the date that those subscriptions expire. Keep all that in mind as you go and go and do it. But I really do want to reiterate, I think a lot of attorneys think, oh, this is, I'm going to retire off of this and like sell my firm. And that's going to give me even more of the stream retirement that I've wanted my whole life. And they get a very rude awakening when they realize that their firm actually isn't really worth much. They don't really have clients that are going to stay on, you know, in perpetuity to make it economical for someone else to take over that firm, right? It's really just, you know, I do general practice or I do family law or I do criminal. And yes, you've been making great money, but there's nothing really that sets your firm apart at that point where it would be generating even more value after you leave or that it would be a real value add for another attorney. So I want to say you can always be optimistic about selling your firm in the future or about, you know, getting money out of it at the end of the day, above and beyond just your regular practice. Uh, but the more, more and more I see it, that basically your firm's not going to be worth much unless you invest heavily into marketing and, and unless you are an absolute rainmaker and you get just a metric ton of referrals based off of that too, or you have clients that would need to stay on for years with you, right? So there's always going to be some random outliers there, but generally, especially for solo and small practitioners like myself, chances are your firm's just not going to be worth what you think it is. But it pays to have a business valuation done and see what you're actually working with and see if it's something that you should be shooting for in the future. All right, everyone's favorite, let's contemplate our mortality today, uh, unexpected cessation of practice. <laughs> what does this mean? So this can mean a couple different things. One, disasters for law firms. So maybe a hurricane has hit. I practiced in Houston. Hurricanes were a very frequent thing, which is scary. And everybody in Florida, my brethren, understand too <laughs> what happens when hurricanes hit. I think Florida is a little bit better prepared for it, honestly, than Texas ever will be. Uh, so I get it. But, you know, that impacts your firm and what happens to your clients, what happens to your cases, what happens to your files. You need to think about things like that. Also, man-made disasters. So what happens when there are fires and industrial incidents, things like that. And then the most important to me to discuss here is really just health issues. What happens if you're in an accident? What happens if, you know, for some reason you're in a coma for a few months, you know, who takes over your firm? What happens? Because the ultimate goal at the end of the day is that you are making sure that the client services are uninterrupted, right? They don't see any disruptions. They don't know what's going on. They just know that at all times their information is safeguarded and that you are continuing on with their case. All right, so as far as health issues go, this is something that I see probably on a weekly basis uh, in our Texas attorneys group. And also this is very much ever present in any type of a, any type of Facebook attorney group and any type of listserv. Honestly, this happens all the time. And so this is a text that I got. Uh, so a friend is currently experiencing a medical emergency. We think prop. We think possibly a stroke. She doesn't have anyone designated to take over her firm. She is incapacitated and not able to designate anyone now or in the near future from what they understood. Uh, so I'm helping out her husband, who is her medical POA, but is not an attorney. What should I be doing to help safeguard her firm and her clients? 
So this happens all the time because we as attorneys are our worst clients. So chances are we have, you know, Florida is better than most, quite honestly, for in inventory attorneys. But on the whole, attorneys generally don't have anything set up yet. I don't have a will other than a holographic one that I wrote before a surgery. So we are our own worst clients and I get it. But when it comes to our firm, it's not just us that we have to worry about now, right? It's now we have to worry about our clients and we have to worry about our family members and to not add on this extra stress, right? That a family member would have to take on if you were incapacitated. So how do you do this? How do you make things easier? So Florida requires that you designate an inventory attorney. And I've included the link there just in case no one is familiar. And so you can designate your inventory attorney. And you can also, I would really, uh, I would really caution you or not caution you, but counsel you to revisit this every year or two when you're looking at things to improve for your firm and just to make sure that nothing's changed between you and the relationship with your inventory attorney, because sometimes that can be easy to kind of not think about or go by the wayside. But essentially, Florida says you must do this, which is miles ahead, I'll tell you right now, <laughs> than most of the other states where they either make it optional or vast majority don't even have any option at this point. So when somebody's incapacitated or somebody dies, it is a mad scramble to go through the court system to try to get the judge to issue an order so that somebody can go into your office, access your files, and deal with your clients. So it just creates a lot more hassle. And this is just a wonderful thing that you can do to protect yourself and your firm by designating this inventory attorney. But I do want to point out that an inventory attorney is not required to represent your clients. So when you are picking someone, this does not mean that this is going to be the attorney that takes over all of your cases. That's not a requirement. What they're going to do instead is they're going to be the ones that step in to contact your clients, encourage them to obtain legal counsel, and make sure that their client files are properly returned. So what you need to do as an attorney is formally designate that inventory attorney as Florida is required. And then also a lot of people forget this, but if you can, and if you trust that inventory attorney, designate that attorney on your technology if applicable. So sometimes that's a password management system. Sometimes that's the practice management software. So depending on what you need, maybe also too in your password management system that's going to include access to your trust account, which is going to be one of the main things that an inventory attorney or that somebody is going to need to access, right, as they get settled and as they start figuring out what to do with your client files. So remember that, especially if you're looking at triaging, what are the main things I need to do or the main things that somebody would need access to? Well, for one, that's going to be your practice management software if you have it. And then it's going to be your trust accounting. So it's going to be your trust account. So your stuff with your, your, you know, login information for your bank, things like that. They need to be able to know at any given time how much money is left. If they need to refund a retainer so that a client can quickly go and find another attorney. They need to have that option and that access it just makes it a whole lot easier if something happens. In every, so when I say password management software, if you are not using one, I highly, highly, highly uh, recommend that you do. Although I put LastPass on here and LastPass actually has had some breaches, uh, quite a few actually in the past year or two. Although they say nothing was compromised, but still maybe don't use LastPass. Uh, I like Dashlane or OnePass is also a good option, but essentially for those unfamiliar, this is software that stores all of your login information for every account that you have in one space. Bought. So you no longer have to remember, you know, as I had, as I had to do nine different logins <laughs> to all of your different types of legal technology software that you have. Instead, it's all here and it auto fills it in for you, which is fabulous. This is also complete aside if you have elderly parents or grandparents. This also was great to do just in case uh, to have all of their stuff designated in here and all that information is in an encrypted software like Dashlane makes it a lot easier if you need to do something, especially if you have a POA and things like that for your parents or your grandparents. This makes it a lot easier on your life too, just because you don't have to keep all of that in your brain or in a random paper shoved in a desk drawer somewhere. Have fun with it. <laughs> but so all that to say, 
If you are using these password management softwares, each one is going to have a different way to designate an emergency contact, which if again, if you trust your inventory attorney, uh, I recommend that you do this too. But essentially, LastPass allows you to designate, hey, people I trust, and then Dashlane kind of took away this emergency contact feature, but they still allow you to do it. I put this link in the slide so you can go and visit that too and designate them on, on a, that software also. And then I just really quick plug, shameless plug, but I want to talk about the importance of integrated systems, both for if you are selling your firm and then if there's been an unexpected cessation of practice. Again, say that five times fast. So if you are utilizing legal technology software or you're thinking about it, make sure to use your software wisely. So think about if the intention is to eventually sell your practice. This consideration should be in the back of your mind as you navigate kind of the landscape of legal technology, because it is going to be so much easier to say, I'm looking to sell my practice. You know, here's everything that I have. Here's what I have in my trust account. Oh, by the way, I also use a practice management software, which is basically you saying every single thing is wrapped up in a bow. I could give this firm to you tomorrow. Although, you know, Florida obviously requires 30 days. <laughs> you could say, I could give this firm to you tomorrow and you could pick up and run with it immediately. So you would know what cases were active, what cases were closed, any deadlines coming up, discovery, trial, you know, hearing or otherwise, everything is already saved into that system. So it is literally the best thing you can do to just say, here's your login to it and you're done. As opposed to what happens now with a lot of firms when they sell it, and what causes a lot of people to not move forward with the sale is they basically come in and audit that law firm <laughs> and they're having to spend hours upon hours upon hours in the file room trying to figure out what's ca what case is closed, which is not. And it's just a mess, like really just trying to figure out your active cases versus your closed cases is a lot harder than you think. Most of these firms do not keep good records. And more and more firms are adopting practice management software, you know, like Smokeball, obviously, you know, or Clio or Practice Panther and things like that. So it does make it easier when you are utilizing those systems to be able to say, okay, yes, you can take over my practice. This is easy. You can break everything out by individualized trust account. Done. So just makes it so that it's not as sketchy <laughs> as if you have to actually go into the firm and find the client files yourself and try to figure out where the heck you even are on any given case. Has discovery even been served in this case? I don't know, you gotta go find that file. Or I don't know, you really gotta look on the firm drive under this folder, under this subfolder, under this subfolder. And then if there's a discovery pleading in there, that means that we've served it. You know, is there a file stamp copy in there? Okay, then we've served it. As opposed to just being able to click somewhere, <laughs> you know, in your system where it says, yes, you've served discovery, you're at the mediation stage of this case. Makes it a lot easier. Also, too, considering for integrated systems or software, if you get into an accident tomorrow and someone needs to cover for you, can they easily locate and work your active files? Which for a vast majority of firms is not possible. They don't know if somebody were to come into your firm tomorrow, chances are they have no idea. They have no idea what client owes you money. They have no idea where every single case is in your office. A lot of people keep rudimentary spreadsheets, you know, about where they are, like discovery has been served. We have a hearing coming up on the 5th. Cool. <laughs> but it's very clunky, very outdated, and you have to go in there and manually change things. It just makes it a lot easier, again, when you can just tell somebody, all you have to do is log in and everything's there. All the relevant deadlines that are coming up, here are the, the last time you contacted the client. So there's a feature in Smokeball called com Communicate, and anytime anybody touches that case and contacts that client, it's in the communicate feature. So I don't have to worry about if I wasn't copied on something that a paralegal sent out. I see it in communicate, which is wonderful so that at any given time, again, I know exactly what's happening in that case. And when the client was last contacted, it is lovely. <laughs> so really just at the end of the day, whether you're selling or whether you're, or whether you're just figuring out what to do, if you get into an accident, ask yourself, can someone just pick them Im immediately where I left off and run my firm? and protect my client's interests. Also shameless plug too, because I know uh, talking about unexpected cessations of practice and death and you know impairment and hospitalization is not the most fun and the most happy topic to do or to talk about during your lunch break, so I get it. But I really did want to say, utilize the services that your bar offers you 
you know, the Florida Lawyers Assistance Program is there for you. And if it's anything like Texas, it's not just for, hey, I have a substance abuse problem. It's, hey, my family member just died. I need, you know, I don't know if I can do this. I need to get things reset. I need to push back deadlines. I just can't function right now. There are services there to help you through that. There are services there to help you through grief. It's not just a drug addiction program, right? So attorney wellness, especially right now, is paramount. And also, I feel like we're seeing, at least at least for me, I'm seeing a lot more opposing counsels who are terrible people and will not cut anyone slack and are just nasty and mean for the sake of being nasty and mean, which I think is a blow to our profession as a whole. And so it's just one of those things where I'm always going to value attorney wellness. I think everybody, especially pandemic on, we went through such a stressful period of time. And I feel like right now, it's almost like our bodies were in shock and they're just kind of catching up right now. So there's a lot of burnout happening right now. Utilize the services that your bar offers. I really encourage you to do that. And Florida has such a great great system and a great uh, attorney assistance program. But yeah, don't be that person that says, I'm not giving you a discovery extension when it doesn't adversely affect your client in any way and you just want to be an ass. So maybe don't be that person and just offer the discovery extension because everybody needs a little bit of grace. At the end of the day, there was a case in Texas the other day where an opposing counsel denied the discovery extension request of an attorney whose husband was in the ICU. So that should not be who we are as part of this profession is really just what I want to say there. Just be kind. You know, you never know what's going on with someone. All right. And just rounding this out, we're about to launch a couple polls and we're actually there's going to be something really fun coming up in a second. But I just really want to reiterate. I know we talked about having everything in one ecosystem and how much easier it would be if you had software when you're looking at valuing your company or selling it or if something happens to you. If you have any questions whatsoever about Smokeball, please reach out. It really did transform my practice and saved me from many a nervous breakdown. And actually, my old firm just adopted it last year. So it's happening. <laughs> I think they finally uh, saw how happy I was and thought, oh, maybe we were doing things wrong. Who knew? All right. So <laughs> this is a really a uh, fun thing coming up too. So Smokeball, we are actually an approved member benefit provider for the Florida Bar. And as members of the Florida Bar, you actually are eligible for a 10% discount on our subscriptions. So really encourage you to go scan that QR code and see what's going on and see what we offer Florida attorneys. But the promo code is FLBAR if you're looking at it. But QR codes are my favorite thing right now. All right. And then actually we're about to, as I said, we're going to launch a poll and it's just about if you would want to learn more about Smokeball, how it can help your firm. And so oh, that's, yes, it's popped up right now <laughs> and how it can help your firm. So if you select yes, uh, one of our specialists will reach out to you and it will be basically, it's really just about how to make things work better for your firm. So sometimes it'll, you know, sometimes here's the deal. Sometimes legal technology doesn't help your firm at all. So a lot of it is just realizing what's a good fit and what can save you time, what can save you money when it comes to your legal software. Because if it doesn't make me money and it doesn't give me more free time back in my day, I don't want it, especially as a family law attorney. It was, you know, I'd be at the office from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. every night wondering where I went wrong in my life. <laughs> so legal technology, though, is a beautiful thing. And once I realized what it could do, I had no idea. I truly had no idea the power of it all. I had no idea what the heck automation was and why that should matter for me. And then you get into it, you start using it and you realize, oh, this could actually change the entire trajectory of my firm. So it's pretty incredible. So if you want to learn more, you can say, yes, I'd love to. No, not at this time. Or if you're already a Smokeball customer, welcome. Welcome, welcome. All right, and we'll just leave that up for another second. There we go. All righty, so. Oh, here's another wonderful thing. I think the odds are ever in your favor as I'm looking at how many people are attending. So we're actually giving away a $100 gift card uh, just randomly if you put in your information. So you can click on this link. Kathy is going to put that into the chat right now. And I'll just leave this up for a minute, but essentially just enter in your information and you are uh, entered in to win this gift card. And you at this point have a one in 31 chance of getting it. So the odds are Mwah, very much ever in your favor. So make sure to find that link in the chat and you can click on that. All right, I think in the last few minutes we have, we're gonna go through and then I'll put the, uh, by the way, don't leave, I'll put the um, uh, course information up uh, in the next couple minutes too. But Kathy, do we have any questions? 
Uh, yeah, we have a couple questions, Jordan. Uh, the first one is, if I was going to create a checklist for succession, what should I be listing? I would say one, do you have an inventory attorney designated? And then two, absolutely make a list of every single piece of technology and login information that you have for your firm, because some stuff you just don't even realize, right? Like I have an Iron Mountain subscription. Okay, where is that information? Who has access to that? So even all these little minute things are necessary to run your firm, right? And if somebody needs to come in and take over, hey, they need to be able to access all of this. So really it's just making a list like that of all the logins. And like I already said before, the password management software, things like that, all of that should be on your list as far as if somebody needed to take over tomorrow, what would they need from me? And it would be those. Those would be the bare minimum things, right, that you would need. And then if you don't have a practice management software, that's going to be obviously more cumbersome because then your list needs to include, you can't just pull a report like you would be able to in like Smokeball or other practice management software. So you would need to include all of your clients, including closed cases too. But all of your clients, uh, any relevant deadlines coming up, their trust account funds, especially their individual trust account funds, so not just solely yours. Uh, if any of those trust account funds are, you know, belong to third parties and not actually are billable, you know, you can't bill against them. You have to do that too. So it's going to create a lot. It'll take a lot more time to do it that way, but you absolutely can. It's just a more manual process. Okay, and here's another question. Um, what are you recommending about retirement, not selling, but giving up the firm? It's tough because I think you work that hard and you develop this firm and you get it up to where it needs to be, right? But there's no guarantee that it's going to be actually uh, a profit center going forward. So what I recommend is for one, make sure that you're utilizing a 401k. I know a lot of firms, the bigger that they are, in theory, don't really do 401ks, but you should regardless be putting money into at least like a Roth account, things like that. Obviously, I'm not a finance expert. This is just what I hear from people who are on the verge of selling their firm or trying to figure out what to do. That's going to be a big deal. And as far as your firm goes, if you're thinking, especially if you have time. So if you're thinking of maybe retiring in 10 years or so, well, now's the time you can build up your firm. And now's the time that you can you can develop your referral network and things like that. So you might be a very big name, you know, in the sphere right now, but maybe that's not paying off for you. People respect you, but are you getting a lot of referrals, right? So maybe now is the time to concentrate on referrals, which that means your name is going to be worth something in 10 years once you decide to retire. So I think a lot of it is just dependent on what you want to focus on and how much money you want to get out of things. But sometimes that also means that you bring a younger attorney on and you say, we're going to do this and here's the split that's going to happen here. And so you're going to continue generating that money too. But again, you just have to have some trust in that person. Perfect. Um, we have another question. Uh, what's the most important piece of technology to have for succession purposes? Well, obviously I'm biased and I'm going to say, <laughs> I'm going to say uh, practice management software just because it can do everything for you. But otherwise, I mean, it's really good to have some sort of trust accounting capability, trust accounting software, because when people come in and say they want to buy your firm or what's the number one thing they're going to ask for, right? It's going to be what's happening with your trust account or your operating account, right? It's going to be the money going in and the money coming out and what money is viable and what money's not. So to me, when I'm looking at it and I go in and honestly, and I've talked about how paranoid I am. I mean, we had an attorney come in wanting to uh, merge with us or wanting to come in as a partner. And I just heard some things about this attorney and about how maybe this would be a little bit of a shady issue. And he presented us with his bank statements. Here's what's happening in my trust account. Here's what's happening in my Ulta. And I told the managing partner, I was like, I don't, why they asked for my opinion, I know not. <laughs> but I told the managing partner, I was like, none of this makes sense to me. And I would only feel comfortable if we were to accompany him to the bank and had them pull out those statements right then and there. And so the attorney said, not a bad idea. And she broached it with this, uh, you know, would be partner and said, Hey, I think we're on board. We just really want to go to the bank with you and grab these statements. though in person, it's just a thing that the partners are requiring just as an extra step. And he immediately said no. And immediately, 
sorry, and immediately made up an excuse and said, oh no, I found another buyer. I'm gonna go be a partner at this other firm, which was a lie. But clearly there were some shady things happening. I would say, <laughs> I know this is a tangent, but I really wanna say do as much due diligence as humanly possible when you are thinking of buying a firm. And I think that's actually all we have time for as I cough my life away. But if you have any questions, please email me. I'll put my information down. But Florida Bar CLE information is here. We will be emailing this to you tomorrow. So don't worry if you don't copy it down. But the course number is 7555. This is worth uh, an hour for general credit and an hour for ethics credit. Who doesn't love that? But again, course number is 7555. And we'll be emailing that out. And then if you have any questions, want to talk shop, want to talk about things that I've seen from people trying to sell their firm, <laughs> maybe stuff that I can't necessarily say, you know, on a CLE, please feel free to email me. I'm jordan.turk at smokeball.com or that QR code. It will give you access to my LinkedIn. Feel free to follow me and send me a message that way. But it's been an absolute pleasure. And I really appreciate everyone's time today. And thank you so much to the Florida Bar for having me. This has been wonderful.